You're listening to an interview taken from the Tonic Talk Show and Podcast, heard exclusively on Zoomer Radio. To download or listen to the original episode or other episodes of The Tonic, please visit thetonic.ca. Joel Thuna is a master herbalist and general manager of Purely Natural. He strives to improve the quality of natural products in the market and passes along his knowledge of herbal remedies through lectures and articles. Joel is both a regular contributor to Tonic Magazine and this show. Welcome back. Happy New Year, etc., etc. How you doing? I am so looking forward to a wonderful 2021. <laughs> I think we all are. I think we're all in. That's a poker term. Oh, but, yeah. But I, I think things are looking up. I think there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And that's all positive. Last month on the show, we discussed vitamin K2, which is one of the more obscure vitamins. I think everybody knows about D and A and C and B and E. And we're going to discuss a particular aspect of it today. But perhaps you can just sort of run through a little bit about what we covered last month. Sure. Last time we talked about K2, specifically the MK7, which is the most bioavailable form. And we discussed its role in removing calcium from places your body doesn't want it to go and putting it in places where your body does want it to go, namely your bones and teeth. And in doing so, how it plays a key, in fact, vital role in both bone health and in cardiovascular health by reducing the risk of heart disease and improving bone density and reducing the risk of osteoporosis all at the same time. Okay, today we're going to focus on another aspect of MK7 because this particular, what is it, a nutrient? What would you call it? Oh, it's a vitamin. So MK7 also plays a role in helping us with our lung health, right? Yes, it does. Yes, it does. A rather key one. So let's talk about our lungs and the role that they play in our existence, our system. Sure. Well, as most people know, Every cell in your body needs oxygen in order to live and survive. The air we breathe contains oxygen and a whole host of other gases. When you breathe in, your lungs expand and they take in and process air. Once in the lungs, oxygen is pulled from the air and moved into the bloodstream where it gets carried throughout your body. At each cell in your body, oxygen goes in and it's exchanged for waste and gas, and specifically waste gases, the big one being carbon dioxide. Your blood then carries the carbon dioxide to your lungs, and when you breathe out, your lungs contract and push the carbon dioxide out of your body. Essentially, that is respiration. (laughs) Okay, and that's particularly important these days because, of course, covid can impact our ability to get oxygen into our bloodstream, correct? Correct. COVID is primarily a respiratory illness attacking your respiratory system, so attacking your lungs. Okay. But there are other ways in which our lungs might be attacked through illness and aging. Can we sort of go through the impacts that the lungs may have over the course of our lives? Sure. Like most things that happen to us as we age, your lungs' abilities decline. It's a gradual process, but it does happen. In some of us, this makes breathing slightly more difficult progressively as we age until it becomes truly difficult. But beyond this natural decline, there are several ways your lungs get damaged that we can control. The most common damage occurs from smoking, vaping, and secondhand smoke. Smoke damages your airways, and particularly the small air sacs called alveoli that expand and contract in your lungs. Because in order for your lungs to expand and contract, these little itty-bitty airways have to do that. This leads to lung diseases including COPD, which includes emphysema and chronic bronchitis. In these conditions, airflow is reduced due to inflammation, scarring, and the breakdown of both lung tissue and particularly the small airways, those alveoli, in the lungs. The same damage that smoke causes can also be as a result of long-term exposure to lung irritants, primarily chemicals and fires, and chronic bacterial infections. And what ends up happening with all of these is you essentially just, every time, every little bit, you just damage those air sacs and those little itty-bitty airways in the lungs, and every little bit adds up over time. Right. So, like, do we regenerate these cells, or is it kind of like when you damage them, you damage them? You can't regenerate them, but it's a slow process. Okay. 
So it's not like skin or other organs in our body, which may regenerate a little bit faster. Like lung damage is serious because it's, it's hard to reverse. Correct. Okay. So everybody has heard the term pneumonia, but how does it fit into this notion of, of lung damage? What's that about? Well, pneumonia is a very specific type of damage. Pneumonia is an infection that inflames the lung alveoli, which are those small sacs. The sacs end up filling up with fluids of various types or pus, reducing their ability to take in oxygen. And that just makes sense if you think about it. If something is filled with liquid, it can't contract properly. Right. This causes us to cough. It, it ends up having phlegmy or pus coughs, fever chills, and difficulty breathing. Pneumonia can be caused by a variety of organisms, including bacteria, viruses, and fungi. And what ends up happening is they get into the lungs, they take hold, and they just go rampant, and your lungs are suffering the whole time. Okay, now let's shift gears to COVID. How does COVID attack the lungs? COVID is truly insidious in how it affects your lungs. It attacks them not one way, but multiple ways. COVID can cause pneumonia, which causes the lungs to be filled with fluid and inflamed, leading to breathing difficulties. And while most people recover from regular pneumonia without any lasting lung damage, the pneumonia associated with COVID-19 is usually more severe. Even after the disease has passed, lung injury may result in breathing difficulties that can last a long time or even a lifetime, they theorize. Right now we don't know, but we theorize that. If the pneumonia does not resolve, but actually worsens, more and more of the alveoli become filled with fluid leaking from blood vessels in the lungs. Eventually, severe shortness of breath sets in and leads to acute respiratory distress, which is a form of lung failure. These people, the ones who have the respiratory distress, are the ones who are unable to breathe on their own and require ventilators to survive. Now, people who survive respiratory distress and recover from COVID-19, the doctors think that they have lasting damage and scarring in their lungs that may last their entire lifetime. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's being missed. So there's a lot of people out there who are thinking, oh, this is a disease that only hits people who are infirmed, people who are older, pre-existing conditions, immunity issues. The problem is you can be very healthy, get COVID, and then have these long-lasting impacts that would change the quality of your life for the rest of your life, no matter how old you are. Correct. At any age and at any health level. That's the scariest part. Right. It truly is non-discriminatory. It can attack anyone. And my understanding is one of the key factors in determining whether or not you have COVID or not, aside from the, the swabs and the testing, is, is uh, reduced blood oxygen levels, right? Correct. And reduced lung capacity. Right. Because I note that Apple, with their new smartwatch, has a sort of a blood oxygen counter. And a lot of people are sort of using that to monitor whether or not they may or may not have COVID. Correct. It's, it's not a foolproof no. method, but it's, it's an indicating method. Okay. Let's shift gears. Let's talk about healthy lungs and what they need in order to operate properly. And if you look at healthy lungs, you'll see that the, the tissue, the lung itself, is soft, supple, and elastic. With these properties, the lungs can expand and contract fully, enabling them to receive and push air, and with it oxygen and carbon dioxide, in and out, so we can breathe properly and get the most of every breath. There's a one special protein that enables tissues, lungs, arteries, skin, and connected tissues, to remain soft supple and elastic. Normally when I say that, people jump in and go, I know, it's collagen. Guess what? It's not collagen. Nope. <laughs> nope. It's a tissue that's roughly a thousand times more flexible than collagen, and it's called elastin. Hmm. Good name. It is. And it's no coincidence that elastin sounds very much like elastic. I like to think of elastin fibers as mini elastics. They stretch and contract time and time and time and time and time again enabling tissues that contain them to expand and contract and return to shape in perpetuity. Okay. Like many other body structures, unfortunately, elastin peaks when you're young and slowly degrades as you age. This is one of the reasons why skin sags as we age. 
Elastin has one other glaring flaw. It really likes calcium. And we all know that you need calcium to live. You need calcium. It's vital. Mm -hmm. But elastin will actually pull calcium from wherever it can get it, i.e. all of its surrounding tissue. Unfortunately, what ends up happening is calcium will bind to the elastin, hardening it and reducing its elasticity. This is a process called elastin degradation. If enough calcium is present, the elastin becomes so degraded that it can no longer stretch and, in effect, becomes useless. This results in stiffening and hardening of the lungs, reducing their ability to expand and contract, and, in turn, reducing your ability to breathe. Hmm. Now, when you combine elastin degradation with scarring, that is the net effect of lung disease. The two processes work together to slowly decrease lung capacity and, in, in effect, destroy lung tissues. But you have some good news for us, right? And that is the role of vitamin K2 and, in particular, the MK7 strands. Definitely. I always try to have good news. Yep. I don't want to be a downer. No, no, no. <laughs> vitamin K2, MK7 plays a vital role in calcium metabolism. We covered that last month. Yep. It activates a protein called matrix GLA protein, which is responsible for removing calcium from our arteries. It also activates another protein called osteocalcin. This is the protein responsible for putting calcium into bones and teeth. Together, these proteins take calcium away from where we don't want it and put it where we do. Luckily for us, vitamin K2, MK7 does the same thing in lung tissue. Mm. It removes the calcium from your lungs in order to deposit it into your bones and teeth. By removing the calcium from surrounding tissues, it leaves it unavailable for elastin. Essentially what happens is the elastin in your lungs is trying to pull calcium from the tissue of your lungs around it, and it doesn't find it, so it can't pull it. This has the net effect of preserving the elastin, enabling your lungs to remain soft, supple, and elastic, and expand and contract properly. Hmm. Primarily because of this property, researchers have found that supplementing with vitamin K2, MK7 reduces your risk of multiple lung diseases, including COPD and emphysema, and here's the kicker, by a staggering 39%. Wow. It's a huge number. Even, even the researchers were shocked at how high that number was. This research, is it relatively current? Is this new research, or has this been around for a while? It's both. It was originally done about a decade, decade and a half ago, but it has since been corroborated repeatedly through multiple trials. So how much of the vitamin K2, MK7 do we need in order to get these happy effects? They've seen this effect in doses, daily doses, anywhere from between 60 to 120 micrograms a day. So it's still a really, really small amount. Okay. Now, when it comes to K2 and COVID-19, there's, there's even more science behind it. And yes, of course, this science is relatively new. Yeah. First of all, I want to put it out there with the question, will vitamin K2 in NK7 or any other form prevent COVID-19 infection? And the answer is no, it will not do that. That's way too much to ask of anything. Yep. But here's what, where it gets really cool. What the virus does is it causes blood clotting and degradation of elastin in the lungs. That's what COVID-19 does. Luckily for us, here's two of the key processes that in your body, vitamin K2, MK7 is involved in. Mm -hmm. What it does is it, first of all, as we discussed earlier, it reduces degradation of elastin, preserving lung health. What it also does is it activates three other proteins, C, S, and Z, which together work to regulate clotting and coagulation. So proper levels of vitamin K2, MK7 are prime in your body to fight and weather the storm of COVID. In multiple studies, researchers looked at patients who have contracted COVID-19 and found a link between vitamin K2, MK7 deficiency and the worst coronavirus outcomes. Essentially, patients with lower daily intakes of K2, MK7 were more likely to have serious outcomes from the virus. They found that when fighting COVID, the body rapidly used up its K2, MK7 stores so having larger stores to start with, they theorize, could definitely help. Are you currently supplementing with the MK7? Oh, heck yeah. 
I take it every single day, and almost everyone I know, I have been preaching to them to take it daily. And the good news is, even if we're not looking at this, it does so many other good things for you that there's literally no downside. Fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and sharing the information about MK7. Thank you very much. It's always my pleasure, and I just want to wish everyone a very happy 2021 and stay safe.